so we'll get started day first first things first thank y'all y'all have taken time out of your schedule out of your summer to come in and, and spend it with us and that's a sacrifice on your part and we appreciate y'all doing that we hope that this experience is a good experience for you we've done this uh this is our third year. The first year we had 16. I think I may have told y'all that. The second year we had about 32, and this year we've got close to 42 students here and, and several faculty members with us today. And it's a learning process for us, and we will ask, we're gonna do a survey with y'all after you leave, and we're gonna ask y'all to fill the survey out and tell us what you think. After the first one, one of the comments that we heard was, how do you, y'all call this a leadership conference, but you can't teach leadership in a day. I agree. 100%, our purpose is to have a conference and hopefully you get one little nugget, one little something, or maybe two, and if you're lucky, you get three somethings that you can take away that will help you be a better leader, help you be a better person, help you be a better something, okay? or at least it makes you think about who you are and what you are, and it helps you evaluate yourself. That's what it's about. That, that's what a leadership conference is about. I've been to a lot of leadership conferences in my life. I've been to a lot of leadership programs in my life, and all I'm looking for is a couple of nuggets, a couple of things that I didn't know before. That makes sense, y'all? So why are we here? Why are we here? Well, let's be honest. One reason we asked y'all here is that it's a recruiting event. We're looking to hire people. And one way for us to get to know people is to invite you to come to a, an event such as this. And a lot of, a lot of other firms have these and, and they're doing the same thing. Y'all know that, y'all are smart. I've, I've looked at your transcripts. I know the grades you make. Y'all figured that out, right? So we're evaluating y'all constantly. We've got people sitting around the room making notes. And, nah, not really, we're not doing that. <laughs> but, but we are evaluating y'all and, and checking to see if we feel like it's a fit, okay? The other side of it is you're evaluating us, right? You come to one of these things and you say, okay, I wanna see if I really like those folks at Nichols Colley and Associates. I want to know if Nichols Colley and Associates is a place that I might want, go, I might want to go to work. How many of y'all have had those thoughts? Okay, if you haven't had those thoughts, you should have those thoughts, y'all. Whether, whether it's Nichols Colley or whether it's one of the other firms that offer leadership conferences, you need to be evaluating it. Another purpose is that y'all are from a lot of different schools. Take a chance to make friends, make relationships from other people because those relationships can be a long-term lifetime relationship that is mutually beneficial to both. If it's just friendship, it's friendship. That's great. If it, if it is a work-related friendship where you're doing referrals back and forth, that's great. Take your time and meet other people and, and, and try to do, develop relationships because we all get in our little school and our little place and sometimes we forget there's a lot of other folks out here, right? A lot of other schools represented, and we can have a chance to learn from them and, and to meet them and actually maybe become a friend with them. If there was somebody from Clemson here, it would be absolutely impossible to be friends with them. Or Florida, if you went to the University of Florida, there's no way on God's green earth we could ever be friends. But other than that, where's that? Who's from Florida? Who? Oh, Larry. And, and I'm going to tell you, it's hard to like him. <laughs> So part of it is, is, is that. So, so we've, we've got the recruiting aspect, the get to know each other aspect. It's the get to know y'all to get to know each other and, and develop relationships. And then the last part we've talked about is the leadership aspect, is us giving you some nuggets and the team building aspect, that part. Now, some of y'all went through the simulator program yesterday. I've already asked this question. I think it was a good experience. People ask me all the time, why in the world would y'all do a leadership conference in Warner Robins? It's not Atlanta, okay? It's not the place that you would naturally assume that you would go for a leadership conference. And uh, the answer is, I can't give you that experience anywhere else. 
I'm not aware of any place else in the state of Georgia that you can get the experience going through the uh, flight simulators. It's different. It requires teamwork. And it allows you to crash and burn and it not hurt. Okay? And, and that's important. Most of the time when you crash and burn, it hurts. When you break the chairs, it hurts <laughs> even more, but that's not a big deal. Okay, no. Uh, it's okay. I don't own them. And so, you know, you, you can do whatever. Um, <laughs> We, we are bringing some fans in, y'all, so in a little while we'll have, somebody will come in with some fans. We're going to get these fans turned on, try to get some circulation going in here. Thanks to Lori for that idea. Um, so, so we want the team building aspect to get to know each other. That's where you really get to know somebody when you're in that position where you're trying to make decisions and you're, and, and you're talking to them and you find out, man, that person's kind of not the kind of personality I want to be around. Or... This has been a great experience for me, right? I, I enjoyed it and, and we did well and we flew all the way to California and then we flew to Hawaii and then we're in China and we got shot down. All of those things happen because you forget to stop. So that's the experience you got. And then Lori is gonna talk to us about, uh, about some attributes in our life, some leadership attributes and other attributes. And I'm gonna talk a little bit about Nichols Colley and Associates, not much because I don't want this to be something where we're spending four to eight hours talking about tax and talking about auditing and talking about all that other stuff. Because if I were talking to you all about tax and auditing and the services we provided, I would go to sleep while I was talking, okay? I just don't find those kind of, y'all yeah, listen to that stuff all day, right? Y'all got professors back here that teach y'all that stuff and y'all go to sleep while they're talking. So why would you do any different when I'm doing it. Matter of fact, Chuck went to sleep one day teaching his class and he didn't even know he was sleeping through it. Um, yesterday, I was telling them this. I had two tax people, y'all, from the University of Georgia and I, and I was telling them that um, yeah, I'm a generalist and so, and I grew up with an auditor background, so materiality is what I look at and I do tax returns. What the heck, if I'm within $10,000, let's go to the next thing. There's no sense in messing around with that. The IRS needs something fine. I thought she was going to crawl under the table. Please don't come to my class and tell them that. Just, it's got to be right. Okay, so I may not be the best person to tell y'all how to do taxes. Just remember that. So, so we hope you get some nuggets. We hope you get some value from the leadership portion. We hope you learn something from that. So what I want to do today is start right here without a name. So y'all, these little things here to put your names on. Just, just explain that. Front, uh, hmm? front, back, front and back. So we're going to start... table has some. Does anybody else not have one? Thank you. It's Kennedy, right? Yes. With Kennedy. He was president. Mm -hmm. That's all named after. So we're going to start with Kennedy and what Kennedy's going to do is she's going to tell us four things. Who she is, what school she goes to, where her hometown is, and some fun fact about her. Something that she just wants to share with us just because it's fun. Go ahead, Kennedy. Hi, everybody. I'm Kennedy Town. I, am, I go to Kennesaw State University. My hometown is Stone Mountain, Lithonia. And an interesting fact about me, he kind of already said it, my dad named me after President Kennedy. <laughs> <laughs> Good morning. My name is Emily Ferguson. My hometown is Greenville, Illinois. I go to Kennesaw State University, and a fun fact about me, I am an ordained minister, so I can marry people. <laughs> so, <laughs> marriage is no divorces. So. <laughs> <laughs> um, hi guys, my name is Loa. I go to UDA, and uh, I, my hometown is Harbin, China, if you guys know where that is. Uh, a fun fact about me is that I never ate cheese before I came to the United States. <laughs> okay, I was joking about China shooting our planes down. Don't, don't take me seriously about that. I just want you to know that was a joke. Chandler. Uh, my name is Chandler Maxwell. I'm from Statesburg, Georgia. Um, just graduated from Georgia Southern. 
I'll be starting at the Warner Robins office in September. Uh, fun fact about me, I already work on cars and uh, recently bought an old truck and been trying to restore it. My name is Helen Corsi. I'm from Sugar Hill, Georgia, and I just finished my <laughs> master's at Georgia College, and I'll be starting in the Atlanta office in September. Fun fact about me is that I have an identical twin sister. Who is also an accounting major and who, and who also just passed the CPA exam. So congratulations on passing the exam. You got it. All right. Hello, I'm Delina Robinson. I'm from LJ, Georgia. I go to the University of North Georgia right now. And I'm named after Bob Dylan. <laughs> <laughs> hey, my name is Brooklyn. Um, I'm from Rome, Georgia. And I just graduated from the University of North Georgia and I'm starting to back at Georgia Southern. And the fun fact about me is I really love Kai. <laughs> I'm Elsie Seabrown. I go to Georgia Southern. I'm from Cedartown, Georgia, and I was born in Iowa. <laughs> <laughs> Gabby. Okay. Hey, I'm Gabby Novelli. Um, I'm from Alpharetta, um, but I go to Western Carolina University. Um, fun fact about me is I like to play tennis in my free time. Uh, I'm Gabrielle. I'm from Asheville, Alabama. I go to Troy University. The fun fact about me is that I really like board games, so I started the Board Game Alliance at Troy. Hi, I'm Wes Kelly. I'm from Columbus. I go to UGA. And a fun fact about me is I became an uncle about a year ago, so that takes up every weekend now. <laughs> <laughs> hey, I'm Casey Brown. I go to Georgia College, and I'm from Rankin, Georgia. And fun fact, I play baseball at Georgia College. Uh, my name is Braxton Johns. Um, I'm from Statesboro, and I go to Georgia Southern. Um, a fun fact about me is that I've played baseball in three different countries. All right, uh, I'm Josiah Bruin. I'm from Savannah. I go to Georgia Southern. I guess fun fact, I play baseball. No, I'm just <laughs> uh, Fun fact, probably, I uh, love Mexican food. Oh. Hey, no, I'm in Gainesville, Georgia. I went to UGA, and uh, I'm a professor down in Georgia. So, uh, fun thing about me is uh, I love to do woodwork. Um, I'm Paula Mooney. Um, it's a hometown would actually be at in Georgia. Um, I went to UGA. I'm now at Georgia Southern as a faculty member. Fun fact about me is I actually lived on Robbins Air Force Base when I was in junior high. So, glad to mm -hmm. <laughs> Uh, my name is Chris Tryon. I actually work for Nichols Colley in an operations role, uh, originally from uh, Denver, Colorado. Uh, fun fact about me is that I have seven children, including four teenagers right now. <laughs> my name is Larry Winter. I'm from Dalton, Georgia. Fun fact about me is uh, my hobby is that of being a chef. I'm a graduate of the New Orleans School of Cooking and was a chef working my way through college. Uh, Todd Giddens, I'm with Nichols College. Uh, went to Auburn University. I got my master's there. Fun fact, uh, well, I'm from Eastman, Georgia. And fun fact, I like to play golf. I'm not too good at it, but I like to play. <laughs> I'm Kurt Jarrett. I'm a partner in a Rome office with Nichols College. Fun fact about me, and I'm glad I don't do this anymore, but I am probably the only person in this room that has hand milked a cow in their lifetime. <laughs> no, we got another one. <laughs> Two. <laughs> three. <laughs> I'm David Scott, I'm a partner in the accounting office uh, with Berry College. Fun fact about me is I don't think my parents ever thought I'd make it this far, so they're going to send me to military school in the second grade. <laughs> <laughs> I'm a tax intern at the Kennesaw office. Uh, my hometown is Calhoun, Georgia. Um, I'm going to Kennesaw State University in the fall to do the master's program. And fun fact about me, I was homeschooled until I started college. My name is Taylor Moss. I'm from the Kennesaw office, and I'm from originally Kennesaw. Um, a fun fact about me is I've been to two NFL games in one day. Uh, my name is Carson Masters. Um, I graduated from KSU um, just recently in the spring. 
Um, my hometown is Kennesaw, and my fun fact is Marlon says that I've been with Nicholas Colley since I was in eighth grade. <laughs> it's true. My name is Carly McLaren. I work in the Kennesaw office. I graduated from Georgia Southern. And a fun fact about me is I was born in Chicago. Uh, my name is Eric Hodges. I'm from Dublin. Graduated Georgia Southern in 2005. I worked with Nicholas Colley uh, for 11 years in the IT department. Um, so I work really in every office. Uh, fun fact, I've walked the office probably about 15 times. <laughs> so another fun fact about Eric is the boy can dance. He can dance. <laughs> Dwight Stephen, I'm from uh, California, Tustin, California specifically, University of Arizona. Um, I'm a Georgia Southern professor. My fun fact, I was 300 pounds five years ago, and now I do crazy things like run five once. Wow. Well, I'm Chuck Carter. I'm also a professor at Georgia Southern, originally from Iowa. Fun fact is before coming here, I was on the faculty at the University of Alaska and North Dakota State. It's a little warmer. Just a little warmer. Yeah. I'm Jennifer Franks. I work in the Warren Robins office. I've been from there longer than y'all been alive. Um, I'm born and raised here in Warren Robins. I'm a graduate of Georgia College. And a fun fact about me is I have no children on my own, but I have three grandchildren. <laughs> I'm uh, Mary Hightower. I work for the Tidal Wave Auto Spa Company. I'm a project manager, which is a really fun job. Um, I graduated from Valdosta State University back when it was Valdosta State College, so I'm also old enough to be the mother of many of you. Uh, fun fact about me, I am ridiculously competitive at any card game, so if anybody wants to play space, <laughs> I'm in. <laughs> Hey everybody, I'm Jenna Alcotti. I'm from Alpharetta and I go to Georgia College and State University and a fun fact about me is I'm Egyptian. I'm Allie Bass, I'm from Cumming, Georgia. I go to Georgia College and State University and a fun fact is I'm a huge Clemson fan and flew out to California to the national championship. You're a good what? Clemson fan? What? <laughs> <laughs> Hi everyone, I'm Carter Peters. I'm from Dublin, Georgia, and I go to the, uh, the University of Georgia. And my fun fact is I've been skydiving. Uh, my name's Alex O'Haney. I'm from Fayetteville, Georgia, and I go to Kennesaw State University. And my fun fact is I have seen the northernmost dumpster in the United States. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, I'm Matt Reynolds. I go to Kennesaw State University. I was raised in Kennesaw all around it. Um, fun fact about me is I got to go snorkeling on the big reef right outside Belize uh, in high school. Hello, I'm David. I'm from Ecuador. I live in Wildersville. I go to Georgia College. <coughs> and fun fact, I, I love mountain biking. Hi everyone, my name is Carla. I go to Kennesaw State University. Um, I'm originally from Stone Mountain, Georgia, and a fun fact about me is uh, I played for Kennesaw State women's soccer team. Hi, my name is Sarah Disneyus. I go to Kennesaw State, and I was born and raised in Kennesaw as well. Haven't moved much. Um, a fun fact about me is uh, I was a nursing major, was born to become a accounting major. So. Hi everybody, I'm Johnny Marrero. I'm also from Fayetteville, Georgia, but I'm originally from Harrisburg, Pennsylvania, which is the capital of Pennsylvania, if y'all don't know. <laughs> um, let's see, I go to Georgia Southern, and fun fact, I have two dogs and one cat. Hey guys, my name is Matthew Talbot. Uh, I'm from Cumming, Georgia, and uh, I'm transferring to UGA, and fun fact, I've broken each arm four times. <laughs> Hey, I'm Caitlin Bassett. Um, I go to Georgia College, but I'll be at UGA in the fall. I'm from Marietta, and my fun fact is that I come from an Air Force family, so most of my family has been here at some point or another for their life. I'm Lori Altman, and I'm also from Columbus West, and I went to Emory University. And my fun fact is that I grew up riding and competing with racking horses. Anybody know what that is? 
So, who are you? John Diadigo, the Atlanta office, Peachtree Corners. Uh, born in the heart of Atlanta, Grady Hospital. I grew up in Cumming, Georgia. I went to school at the University of Georgia. And a fun fact about me is that I've got a fourth year daughter attending at the University, Georgia Southern University. So, some of y'all might know her. Kate, are you going to tell us about you? I work in the Dublin office, and fun fact about me, I was pregnant this year, or last year about this time, and I think I cried when I introduced myself, so <laughs> not going to cry this year. <laughs> okay, I'm Marlon Nichols. I'm from Bainbridge, Georgia originally, have lived mostly all over the state of Georgia. My dad worked for Georgia Power, and we started moving. I went to the University of Georgia. I'm with Nichols Colley and Associates. A couple of fun facts about me. One is that I love the water and, and my bucket list is to do platform diving off of some really high places or cliffs or something. I've done about 45 feet, I like to do 60 next and I like to get up to about 80 feet before it's all over with. I'm getting a little bit old for it, but that's something I just kind of have this desire to do. Uh, I got to do 45 feet off of a cliff in Hawaii, I actually did a gainer off of it and that was pretty cool, uh, that was about 10 years ago. Um, the other one is, y'all, I hate stuff that makes me feel trapped. Sunscreen <laughs> makes me feel like I am just enclosed in my skin and I can't get out. My wife is always telling me, wear your sunscreen, wear your sunscreen. I say, I would rather have cancer, I think, than have that stuff just compressing me. And one other thing I hate to do is I hate to wear shoes. When I walk in the office, I kick my shoes off under my desk, and the rest of the day I go without shoes, unless I'm going to the bathroom, because that's the place you want shoes on, <laughs> or I have a client come in the room. So I have a question for y'all. Would y'all mind if I take my shoes off and talk to y'all barefooted? <laughs> Good boss. Huh? So you get out of your comfort zone, right? I hate these things. They just drive me absolutely insane. Okay, so today, look at that. I got out of those dang shoes. I've got to look at what some of the things I have to go over with y'all, and then we'll have a discussion. Um, okay, so what we're going to do now is we're going to spend the next uh, few minutes talking about Nichols Collier and Associates and some of my views about leadership and some of my views about me and who I am. I think it's important for y'all as you get ready to go to work somewhere that you evaluate the people you're gonna work with and you know who they are. So I'm gonna share y'all with y'all my story and my evaluation of who I am as part of that. And as I do that, I will talk about some leadership traits that I feel like have been instilled in me by two very important people, really three in my life. And so I, I'm going to talk about that and give you a story. There are a couple of times in this story that I'm going to have to kind of turn around because I'm not going to be able to talk. I've yet to get through it completely, okay? So I'll go ahead and warn you of that. If that happens, just bear with me. The other thing is they're going to bring the fans in. They'll disrupt us. I'm going to keep talking, but it's hot and we're going to try to cool it off a, a little bit. Number one thing, First tidbit that y'all need to know. There are three words I hate when used together with, with the, the last word will be des deserve. I despise, I deserve, we deserve. Okay? Because I have this thing in my life that I really don't deserve much of anything. I have received a lot of things based on where I was born, when I was born, who I was born to who my brothers were, who my si I didn't have any sisters, so I can't say who my sisters were, um, who the people were that raised me and, and the family that was there. And a lot of those were very, very beneficial and they helped me be the person I am and they helped form me, but it didn't create something where I deserve something more than somebody else. Does that make sense, y'all? And so when, when, when I look out there and somebody tells me I deserve this, I cringe because I truly believe that if I got what I deserved, 
it wouldn't be good because there's not much good about me in my natural self. So, so just remember if you come to talk to me and you want to tell me about something, it's okay if we don't pay you, if you're working for us, you say, I deserve my paycheck. I'm good with that, y'all. You do, if you work, you, you deserve your paycheck. I'm talking about at a personal level, a feeling of entitlement, a feeling that I deserve something. So I just want y'all to know that's one of the core things in, inside of me that just drives me crazy is when people tell me I deserve. And I think part of that is, is my dad raised me that whenever I told him I deserved, he took his belt off and beat the snot out of me and told me that's, I, you got what you deserve, okay? Um, not, not totally true, but uh, that did happen. Eric, if we can get one on that side, and um, I don't want to be greedy, point it at me. Um, <laughs> no, just get it running. Um, and so I'm going to tell you kind of the story of my life, and I'm going to tell you where I grew up and what I did, and I'm going to talk about two very important people, my mom and my dad, and the influences they had on my life and on my family life and, and, and what kind of set the core of who I am. You got these two people, and, it, and if you look at them, you would say it's almost impossible that these two people could be married and make it work. And here's the reason why. My dad's father died before daddy was born. He died. I got to be louder? Okay. So here's what happens when I have to be louder. I, I hear myself, so I take my hearing aids out, and then I talk really loud, but I'm not going to... I have board meetings and I have to do that sometimes when the old people in the boardroom can't hear me. Can y'all hear me right now? Okay. So, so my dad's father died when daddy, before daddy was born in a logging accident. Daddy was born in 1927. That was not a great time economically in the United States. That was depression era times. Not very much money. My grandmother had absolutely nothing. She worked as a uh, seamstress and an upholstress. They lived in the absolute poorest section of town. I rode through it the other day. It's still the absolute poorest section of Bainbridge, Georgia. Have you seen the shotgun houses that are, the wood's just worn out, the windows are all warped, and they got cracks in the boards and you can see through them? That's the house my dad grew up in. As a matter of fact, the house burned and they couldn't afford to fix it, so they just par partitioned off the portion that they did. Daddy and, and uh, Big Granny lived in one room and they rented out the other half of it with a sheet to somebody else to help pay the bills. That, that's, that's the environment my dad grew up. No father figure, that, that's, that's where he came from. My mother, on the other hand, grew up on a farm right, right outside of Brinson, Georgia. Brinson's about 15 miles from Bainbridge. You wouldn't know it if you passed it, but it actually is a, is a town in Georgia. And my, mo my mama's father abused her in every way, okay? My, my mother, So my mother had a lot of mental illness. She suffered from a lot of depression, and she suffered from that depression in an era when nobody knew what to do about depression. So sometimes mom would go away for six weeks, and y'all, this is when they're experimenting with people that have depression and mental illness, and some of those experiments were, were not real kind to people, okay? So she would go away for six weeks, and then she would come back and things would be good for a while because I think she just got away from her four boys. And, uh, but she would come back and things would be good. But sometimes mom would cry for three or four days in a row. Or she would just be spaced out and not know that we were there. And so I thought my mother was weak. I grew up thinking my mother is weak and my father is a man's man. Now he, he's about this tall. He had arms about that big around. I told the group yesterday, he didn't, he didn't take any prisoners. And so when we messed up, he could snatch his belt off, pull it around, and beat the snot out of us faster than, you, than, than John Wayne could pull his gun out of his holster, okay? 
And he didn't mind doing it. And he never lied to us. He said, he never told us, this hurts me more than it hurts you. Never told me that. He said, I intend to hurt you. And he did. He never, he whipped me. He never beat me. He may have left a few marks every now and then, but that's okay. I deserved it most of the time. Uh, my two older brothers deserved it more. I want y'all to know that. They were bad. Um, but, uh, but he was a disciplinarian. He was strong. He, w- he was a person that commanded authority. And he, it, it just, his confidence just came out of him. He, he was that kind of person. And some of y'all have, have, have known Daddy over the years, and, and that's who Daddy was. He, he just had that confidence in who he was, what he was, and, uh, and that's what he did. So, so you've got this guy who never had a father figure. You have a mother whose father figure was not a good man, okay? And they get married. And you, you look at that and you say, that's tough, right? That, that's a tough situation because mom had trust issues. And Daddy didn't know what to do. I mean, what the heck? He didn't have any, anybody to give him guidance. He didn't know exactly what the appropriate response was for things. But they made a decision when they got married that they were committed to each other. Okay? They decided that their relationship was the most important thing that they had. Because they really didn't have much. And so they, that was their commitment. And that was a lifelong commitment for them. And so commitment, commitment to a decision, commitment to what you're doing is important in life. And that's a leadership trait I learned from my mother and father is that when you do something, you need to do it totally committed in the good, in the bad, because there was a lot of good and bad. And you need to make sure it's important. Also, Daddy knew what his priority was. He had four sons, but we were not the priority. Mama was the priority. Mama was the priority from day one. Mama was the priority when she died of cancer 50-something years later. And if we mess with Mama, it was a bad day. I'll give you an example. Randy was 15 or 16. Farrell would have been 15 or 16. 14 or 15, we lived in Waycross, Georgia. I guess they were 15, 16. And we lived in Waycross, Georgia. And Randy and and Farrell wanted to go somewhere, and Mama said, no, y'all can't go. So they came up with the idea that when she went into the bedroom, they reversed the locks on her bedroom door and locked her in the bedroom because they knew Daddy was out of town and he couldn't do anything to them, and then they left. Pretty good plan, right? Maybe pretty stupid, but that's what they did. Well, they forgot. Daddy worked for Georgia Power. There's a phone in the bedroom. Mama called Georgia Power. Georgia Power got on the radio, called Daddy. Daddy was 70 miles away. Randy comes in the, in the door first. Now, y'all, this might be child abuse today, but Daddy hit him with his fist right upside the head and knocked him across the yard. And, Far- and Randy is yelling while he's flying, run, Farrell, run. <laughs> Farrell takes off. He's fixing to clear the fence in the backyard. And if you know Farrell, clearing the fence is a feat within itself. <sighs> and Daddy says, if you don't stop, when you get back, you won't live through it. And he almost stopped in midair. Came back and took his punishment. And the punishment was because he messed with Mama. Okay. So lesson number two, know what your priorities are when you're leading, okay? Daddy knew what his priority was in his marriage. He knew what his priority was in his life, and it was mom. And it survived a lot of ups and downs, a lot of conflict, and a lot of things that most, most husbands and wives, they go through all of those things, but it is exponentially different when you have one spouse that suffers from mental illness, okay? So mom and dad has these, uh, these four boys, and, and we had to work. We were, we were not wealthy people. Daddy worked for Georgia Power. He was a lineman. 
Uh, he worked really hard. He was the youngest lineman to uh, ever make foreman in, in Georgia Power at the time he made foreman at 28 years old. He's super smart, didn't have a lot of opportunities for college and other things. But my dad was an extremely, extremely smart person, extremely hard worker, and he believed that we should work. So at 10 years old, before Christmas, we had a deal with a guy that had a, a, a cedar bunch of cedar trees on his land. You know, now y'all think of a cedar tree farm and you think of people going in and pruning them and all that stuff. Man, we sold cedar trees. We went out to this guy's land, we cut them down and we sold them in our front yard. That's the way we made money to buy Christmas presents for everybody because we had to buy our own presents for everybody in the family. That was a requirement. There's no money that's given to you, but you are expected to be a giver. You're expected to give. You're expected to participate in the giving aspects of Christmas. And so we would sell uh, Christmas trees. And we did that until I was 11 years old. And, I went, and we first started that when I was five or six. I really wasn't a great participant at five or six, but I would have to go out in the woods and haul the, help haul the, the trees back in and then stand in the front yard and, and dance like a little idiot because that draw people in to buy the, buy the stuff. So we did that. We sold boiled peanuts. We'd go around town, mama would boil peanuts, we'd go out in the fields, collect boil, boil peanuts, we would boil them, and we'd go around selling little bags of boiled peanuts for a dime. Now y'all, for a dime, I could buy a Coke and a bag of peanuts to eat, or a candy bar for a dime, so that was a lot of money back then, and you know, you sell enough boiled peanuts, you could be the fattest kid in town. And so, so we worked. When, when Farrell and I, when I was uh, nine, I guess, Farrell would have been 13, no, Farrell would have been 12, we decided we were going into the lawn mowing business and we had one of these big bicycles that had a rack on the back of it. So daddy arranged for us to borrow money at nine and 12. We borrowed enough money to buy a bicycle and we had to have it paid off by that summer. So we, we worked paying off a, a, a lawnmower and I had so much money left over that I was like, man, I ate more payday bars. Y'all know what a payday is? I love paydays. I ate more of those things than you can ever imagine. Um, but but we, we paid it off. That was a responsibility trait that dad instilled in us because he believed that we had to earn our way. He believed that we had to contribute. And so the example they gave me that mom and dad gave me was that we have to earn our way. But y'all remember something? Mom's still the weakest person I know. My mom is still the person I view as the weakest person I know. And it's because I could ask her if I could do something, and if she's in one of her spells, if she's in one of her places that's not a good place, she would say yes, and I could just go off and do it. Unless I got home after daddy. And so at nine, I go in and say, Mom, can I go to Four Mile Creek? Well, Four Mile Creek is actually six miles from my, our house. And she said yes, because I knew she was going to say yes. I set it up. I knew what the answer was going to be. She said yes. I got on my bike by myself, rode out to Four Mile Creek, and went swimming by myself. Came home. I made a mistake. Daddy was there, right? He said, boy, where have you been? I said, I went to Four Mile Creek. I talked to mom. He said, you know better. You know when she's like where she is, you can't ask her that question. So what happened, y'all? Do y'all know? I got lit up. And he explained to me that you don't do stuff like that when mama doesn't know better. So, so, so here's the deal. Mom and dad taught me that commitment is important. They taught me that, um, that hard work is important. Uh, what was the other attribute I said a while ago? What? Priorities. priorities are important. You have to set your priorities. And so we go through, but we also had a tremendous amount of fun. We had fun growing up. We, we were really poor, but we didn't know how poor we were, and we had a blast. Randy's four years older than me. Farrell is three years, was, was three years older than me. And my younger brother was four years younger than me. And, and we had a blast. We hunt, we fish. We're out on Lake Seminole. Some of y'all may know where Lake Seminole is. We, had, we were all over that place. Daddy would take the three older ones of us, put us in a, take us out there at 7.30 in the morning before he went to work. And we would be in the boat going up and down the river 
until he got off work and he picked us up at night. I mean, we just had the freedom to do a lot of stuff. And they trusted us to do the right thing. Daddy trusted that if he put us in that boat, that we were going to be there when we got back. Now, the day we went moccasin hunting, Lake Seminole has water moccasins all over the place. And they just kind of set up on stumps and, the, and they sun. And you get your 22 and you go shoot moccasins. Well, we were out moccasin hunting and we killed 10 maybe. And we kept opening the, the mouth up and flipping for the fangs and we couldn't find the fangs. So we were smart. We said, well, these are just water snakes and we just throw them in the bottom of the boat. We got home, we got to where daddy was picking us up and he looked at us and said, y'all are, what? I won't even tell you the words he used. He said, what are y'all thinking? We said, well, they're just water, they're just water snakes, daddy. They're not moccasins. He said, no, watch this. Boom, boom, boom. Every one of them were moccasins. And moccasins really aren't dead when you shoot them the first time. They're still wiggling around. They can still bite you and we're just dumb luck. We lived through moccasin hunting with them. But we had a lot of freedom and, and, and they expected us to do the right thing. The expectation is, you do the right things, these are your parameters, live within it. If we didn't live within the parameters, what happened? Y'all should know what happened, right? I got lit up, right? And, and so they gave, us, they gave us this freedom to make mistakes. They gave us the freedom to make bad decisions and they held us accountable for the bad decisions that we made. Okay, now here, here's one thing I will tell y'all is that for my children, I gave my children a lot of freedom and I gave my children the right to make mistakes, but I also maybe didn't manage it what I think as well as my mom and dad did because I, I also allowed them to have some, some higher level of dependency. A lot of people talk about your generation. Y'all were kind of in between millennial and Gen Y, right? Nobody knows exactly what you are. It's kind of like the millennials and Gen X. We've got a couple of those people that work for us and we're still trying to figure out what they are. They're just all jacked up. A lot of people talk about millennials and Gen Ys and they do it in a very derogatory manner. And I'm gonna tell y'all that that's a bunch of crap, okay? If y'all don't get anything out of this, of what I say other than this, people that tell y'all that y'all are self-centered, that y'all are not loyal, that y'all are whatever. Don't pay any attention to them because in my generation, we had the same issue. There's 20, 25% of the people that are driven, want to succeed, want to do well. And, and if you look back at them, you'll see that they did. And then there's another group that, that are kind of in between motivated. And then there's another group just didn't give a rat's behind about what happened to them. And you know what? Those numbers are almost exactly the same today as they are, were then. They're almost exactly the same. And, and so what you have to look for is if, if I'm looking for the 20% at the top, I have to, I, we have to do a search, right? We have to make sure you have the values. You, we have to make sure that, that you understand who we are and what you are, and you have to do the same thing. But there's also a place for this group that's in the next, next realm. They serve a great purpose. They're just not me. Okay, they may be some of y'all, and, and there's nothing wrong with that. I do have a, a hard deal with the ones, remember I told you I don't like the I deserve, the ones that don't care, the ones that feel like that they're entitled. That group I have a really hard time with, but everybody else, we're in good shape. So, so when you look at what we've got is y'all don't let anybody, don't let anybody put you down because of when you were born. Understand that it's all about your motivational energies to do what you want to do. And y'all work differently than I do. I'm an adopter of technology, okay? Y'all are integrated into technology. Y'all grew up with technology. You don't even think the same way I do. And a lot of times you can accomplish what I could never accomplish because you're willing to embrace what, what is ingrained inside of you. I don't even understand what's ingrained inside of you. I, d I didn't grow up, I remember the first fax machine. Do y'all even know what a fax machine is? You know, that, that's how far back we're going. I remember the first fax machine. I remember getting my first bag phone. Have any of y'all seen a bag phone? 
So I had this phone that was in this little bag and I'd carry it around with me and it cost like a dollar a minute to talk on it. And so you didn't talk for a very long time, but I had this bag phone. I remember when the cell phones came out, I remember the first PC. As a matter of fact, just an interesting story. We're on a military base and y'all, I love this military base. I love this museum. I normally address it a lot more at the beginning, but I think I've kind of beat it, worn that, that out. Uh, I also have hearing aids in my ear that ring whenever my phone ring and I don't know how to turn it off so maybe that will do it. Um, so I was distracted just then. So um, what was I going to do? Tell y'all a story? What was it about? First, first PC. Hmm? First PC. Yeah, so the first PC. Impact of the military. Do y'all know that the, the person that developed the first personal computer ever built left the Air Force as a captain. He did a lot of work in technologies and he built the very first PC ever built. Now he didn't patent this PC, he built this PC and he hired two guys to write an operating program for him. Something to make the PC work on a daily basis and perform functions. Do you have any idea who the two guys he hired to do that were? Bill Gates and what's Bill Gates' partner's name? Hmm? Paul, right. And he, and, he, and, he, and he hired those two guys to write the operating system. They did patent their operating system, by the way, but they did that. And uh, he sold his computer system for several million dollars and moved to a town called Alamo, Georgia. Alamo, Georgia is about 60 miles east of here, near the, the big city of McRae. And uh, he, moved to, uh, he moved to Alamo, Georgia. And he farmed for a while, but you know what happens to farmers who are IT people? They lose all that money they sold for their thing. But he goes and he enrolls in the first class of the medical school at Mercer University in Macon. He graduates with honors and he practices medicine in Cochrane until he passed away. Paul actually came to his funeral and, and, and he and Bill Gates will both recognize Ed Roberts as the uh, father of the personal computer. Ed was a client of ours, a genius, and a little bit crazy, okay? So, so that's just a side story about what the military does and what it, it contributes to technology. Y'all have got to remind me that I forgot to tell y'all a little bit about Nichols Colley and Associates, so when we come to the end of this, I'll back up, okay? So we have... Um, We've talked about my childhood and, and growing up and, and, and having fun. And y'all, the thing about having fun is you're going to be in a career for a long time. Your career can be a lot of different things in adulthood. Y'all are really just now beginning to hit adulthood and your career can, can mean a lot. And it's not measured by money, it's measured by how much you enjoy and what your passion is for what you do. So here's my encouragement for y'all, is you will be a much better leader of people if you are passionate about what you do. My mom and dad were passionate about their family. They were passionate about what we did. They were passionate about spending time with us. And it was important to them. And I believe they were a success in raising their family. And I'll tell you why in a minute. Um, so be passionate about what you do. And if passionate means that I love taking out the garbage and I want to be a garbage man the rest of my life because that's what I truly enjoy doing, if that's what you truly enjoy doing, then you're a success. If passion means you want to be the next uh, John F. Kennedy and be the President of the United States, then pursue that passion, okay? So, so we have to pursue our passions in life. We have to make that important. We have to know that what we're doing is worth doing. And so be passionate and enjoy what you're doing. So when you, you are doing your, your interviews, when you're going to your leadership conferences, when you're doing your internships, Find out if you're passionate. Find out if you think that's a place that you would really enjoy doing. And then if, if you go into public accounting and three years later you say, I hate it, 
I don't want to be here, I don't enjoy it, go sit down with the people you work with and say, I hate it, I don't enjoy it. Maybe there's another path, can you help guide me? I will tell you in our firm, if you have that conversation with us, we're going to have an honest conversation with you. And you know what it's going to be? We kind of figured that out. So you're not doing me any good, and I'm not doing you any good if I know you're miserable and I keep you around, right? Or you stay around and you fake it. So find your passion. Find what you, you want to do. My youngest son is one of the smartest people I know. He made better on the SAT in the seventh grade than I did when I was a senior in high school. He's just smart. Todd may be smarter, but other than that, Alex is a, is a smart, smart kid. Um, but you know what his passion is? He loves to travel. So he teaches school. You know why he teaches school? Because this summer he spent four weeks in London in Germany because that's his passion. That's what he enjoys doing. And so he's found an avenue to get him there. Find your passion because if you have passion, you will be a great leader if you are leading. Here's another thing that y'all need to, to understand. I believe that there are certain other attributes my parents instilled in me, and one of them is service. Although my mom struggled all of her life, she was a servant. She had a servant's heart. Service was one of the most important things to her. When, when she was in her early 30s, late 20s, she started a church in an underserved, poor neighborhood because they didn't have a church. And she started that church, and she, and she worked diligently to build that church up. And it was important for her that those folks had a place to worship and, and she worked hard to make it happen. And the only time I ever saw her upset about anything is when, when they were recognizing her at one of the services and called her the grandmother of the church at 32 years old. She did not appreciate being referred to as the grandmother of the church. She, she kind of thought there was some other term they could have used. But, but she served and she served her children. She served her husband. She served her community. And so one other thing I believe is you can't be a leader unless you're willing to serve. Okay? Another thing is you can't be an effective leader unless you're willing to follow. There are times that you have to step back and say, I'm not the right person to do this, but somebody else is. Let me follow. And so you can't be a great leader if you're only willing to lead. Because if you're only willing to lead, how do you develop that leadership trait in the other people? Right? It's all about opportunity. It's all about giving the other person the opportunity to do something. But a lot of times, you're just not the right person. An example being, how many of y'all can, can do macros in Excel? Okay and pivot tables and, and make Excel do all kind of weird stuff. Now y'all, I can barely create a formula in Excel. I don't know how to center a title at the top. I don't know how to do anything else. So I have an idea of what I want and then I call, I, I have a thing that I do when I, I need to do an Excel spreadsheet. It's really a, a pretty neat, thing that most people haven't learned yet, I dial 1316. Now 1316 is Delaney. And Delaney answers the phone and I said, hey Delaney, I need something to do this, 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 and this. And because she knows how to do all that, she can take it and lead and accomplish the task. And then when she's coming to me from that point forward about what I need, she's leading the conversation because I don't have a clue what it's supposed to do. I don't, I don't understand it. So she has to lead me through that process. And so, just so y'all know, if you dial 1316, Delaney answers the phone and you get spreadsheets. I just want y'all to know that's, that's how that works. Or I can take Jennifer over here, who that if I need something in QuickBooks, I don't even know if I can pull a report in QuickBooks, but I know that if I say, Jennifer, we need this for this client. Conceptually, this is what I need. Jennifer is going to lead that process and she's going to take me and the client and she's going to lead us through the process of how to get there. 
And if I try to lead that process, which I do sometimes, I totally jack it up. Right, Jennifer? Yep. <laughs> and, and so you've got to let others lead sometimes and you have to follow because they know what they're doing and you don't. So, so good leaders are servants. They've got to be willing to serve others. And good leaders have to be good followers. And they have to know when to lead and when to follow. Okay, so a realization came to me several years ago. You know, the medications in, of mental illness got much better. Mom got, got on some of the medica medications. They weren't doing this crazy shock treatment stuff on her anymore. And they got her leveled out. And I came to a realization. How many people f with mental illness can manage to have their marriage stick? raise four boys that are all CPAs, have a husband that still adores them after 50-something years, go into the real estate business and be pretty successful once she gets leveled out and contribute to her community. I will give you all this. I believe that my mother was the strongest person I ever knew. I believe that my mother, she, came over, she overcame obstacles that most people never could imagine overcoming. So when I talk about her and I say she was weak, I had a child's view and a young adult's view of my mother. But as she got older and I got maybe a little wiser, I realized that you can't always judge somebody from what you see on the outside or what you see on the surface. You've got to look deeper and you've got to understand that person. Okay, you really and truly have to have that person and you have to understand that person. And so, so one of the other things I think that you have to do is you have to look for the good in everybody. You have to look for the good in everybody. If you look for the good in everybody, then you change your opinions of those people. And you change it to the good. So quit looking for the bad and look for the good. And I'm going to tell you, there's some people in this world, it's just hard as heck for me to look for the good in them. I mean, I just, you just don't like them. Okay. A couple other things. I need to go over Nichols Call and Associates. Do y'all kind of get a feel for who I am? I believe, y'all, that I was put on this earth to serve other people. I totally believe that. I think that was instilled in me by my mother. I believe it was instilled in me by my father. And I believe that that is the most important thing that I can do is to serve other people. And that's what makes this profession so gratifying to me is because every day I wake up, I look forward to solving somebody's problem. I look forward to doing something for somebody, and I absolutely love it. I'm absolutely passionate about what I do, and I never want to do anything else. I don't know. I'm, I'm going to retire in, in, in several years down the road. I'm, I'm not going to say how many because I may try to talk them into letting me stay a little longer. But, uh, but y'all... I, I, I kinda, I'm worried about it because I love what I do. I absolutely just can't imagine not doing what I do. So love it. But I, I'm here to serve. And, and I think that's my most thing. If I, think, I, I, I hope that if you ask my partners, they will tell you that I'm service-minded. They will tell you that that is important. And, the, and the, that's, that's the way that we lead Nichols Colley and Associates. I will tell you this, I feel like that's the same way all of my partners are. I think every one of them are service-minded. I think that, that, that putting others in front of themselves is important. And taking the worries of the clients on yourself, even if the client doesn't. I cannot tell y'all how many times I have, I have gone to bed at night with a client's problem sitting on my shoulder and it was a little monkey. And I woke up the next morning, I've worried about it all night, and it's a great big gorilla, and, I, and, and, and I'm, I'm struggling with a client that's really not a, a problem, that's really not my problem, it's my client's problem, but I took ownership. Another lesson. When you do something, take 100% ownership in what you do. 
Don't take half the ownership. You take ownership in your actions, and if you screw it up, you own it. If you do a great job, somebody else did it. But you own your actions, and you share the credit with others. Make sure that you understand that that is a nugget that you need to have. Nichols Calling Associates. Started in 1972 by a gentleman named Albert P. Hopkins. He was a um, former Arthur Anderson guy. He had been with them three or four years. He decided he wanted to go home to McRae, Georgia. If any of y'all know where McRae, Georgia is, there's not a whole lot to go home to, but he went back. Uh, a couple of, about four years later, he, five years later, he was looking to add to his practice. He needed another partner, my brother Farrell. Uh, was with Pete Malwick Mitchell or KPMG. He was tired of, of working in Greenville, South Carolina. He wanted to get closer to home. He joined Al in 1977 or 78. I don't remember the exact year. And they had a practice in McRae, Georgia. A couple of years after that, they had an opportunity to open a practice in Dublin. Farrell moved to Dublin. And so we had a practice in Dublin and McRae. In 1985, somewhere around September of 85, August of 85, it was August of 85, Al walked into Farrell's office and said, I'm going to seminary in two weeks. I need you to buy me out. I was the CFO at Jackson EMC in Jefferson, Georgia. Some of y'all may know where it is if, if you live in Athens or Gainesville or around in that area. I was the CFO and uh, at the age of 29 years old, the CEO had died or he wasn't 29, I was 29, the CEO was about 102. He died, I hope y'all got that, that was a joke, okay? I was kinda hoping you would wake you up with that one. Uh, anyway, uh, General Booth died, he was a general in the Army Reserve. He was tough old coot. Anyway, he, he died, saw, he had had bypass surgery and he was sawing pecan trees in his backyard six weeks later and it didn't go very well with the surgery. It did, that's not a good remedy for bypass surgery. Um, so he died and I didn't get the job. And I was really disappointed that I didn't get this job because I was good. Ego about this big, I was good, 29 years old. I'm the CFO for the second largest electric cooperative in the state of Georgia. Uh, I had 40 something people working for me. I thought that I was good and I should get that job. They hired a guy that worked at Walton EMC as the CEO, and he came over to Jackson. He had 10 years experience as being the CEO at uh, Walton, and I was trying to figure out what he had that I didn't have. That's kind of stupid, y'all. You know, he, he had 10 years of experience that I didn't have. He had been a CEO, and, and he was there, but I didn't have an opportunity. And so Farrell called me, we were on vacation. Janie said she knew when I answered the phone that we were moving. And so we moved to McRae, Georgia. And I was in McRae for two years. And in 1987, we decided to open the office in Warner Robins because there wasn't a lot of future in McRae. We had nine people working for us. And we we're gonna open the office in Warner Robins. We opened the office in Warner Robins, Georgia. And at about the same time, a gentleman named Mike Cawley left a CPA firm in Dublin and joined us. And so that's how it became Nichols Cawley and Associates is when the three of us came together in 1987. In 1987, we opened the office in Warner Robins. I went to every CPA firm in town. I told them that uh, we were a young, up-and-coming CPA firm. They were all getting old. They needed to merge with us. They all looked at me. They were in their 50s, and they all looked at me and said, you're, you're full of crap, except for one. And we merged the one in, had a little small CPA firm, and we acquired her firm, brought it into us in 88. And uh, there were four CPA firms in town at that point in time, five including ours. And, um, and so we, uh, we acquired that one. We rocked along till 2000, and we were looking at opening a practice in Carrollton, Georgia. We had a large practice group, in, uh, client group in Carrollton. We were getting ready to sign the lease in Carrollton. Got a phone call from a guy named Joel Reed in Atlanta. We'd never met him. He said, I understand y'all were looking for an Atlanta presence. One of my partners died a year or so ago. I need some help. Would y'all be interested in coming to Atlanta? We left Carrollton and the lease, we didn't sign it. We left the lease immediately. Farrell and I think William drove back to Atlanta and, uh, and worked out a deal with Joel within a week 
to acquire his practice. And we acquired that practice on January the 1st of 2000. Well, at the same time, remember, I went and talked to all those CPAs in, uh, in Warner Robins. Caroline Jernigan, who works for us today, and she wasn't a 50, 60 year old. She was, she was my age almost to the day. Uh, she said she's tired of practicing on her own. She wanted to move to Atlanta. We said, we just, uh, we're, we just acquired an Atlanta office. You merge your practice into us and you move to Atlanta and we'll handle it. Uh, Caroline's a wonderful person, but never buy a practice and tell the person that owns it to move to Atlanta immediately and, and leave you with it because it's a, it's a recipe for disaster. So uh, we did that because Marlon Nichols wanted to do something personally because of his pride, he wanted that practice and I made a bad decision. I let pride get in my way of good decision making. Okay, Pride's a, pride is a tough deal y'all. Pride, pride will get you in trouble. But, but we bought that practice. Um, we rocked along for several years and we got up to about 84 employees in 2015. In late 2015, uh, Donnie McGrath of Grace Galveston McGrath called and said that he was looking to retire in, a, in several years and he wanted to get a transition for his firm. Uh, we told him we had just finished their peer review. We couldn't talk to him at that point in time. Let's wait until the peer review report was accepted. We would talk to him. A couple of months later, the peer review report was accepted. We sat down and had discussions and we acquired that firm. They merged in with us on February the 1st of 2016. And there are some people, no, there's not anybody in here that is from Grace Galvis, but they will agree. Well, not from, yeah, Carson was there. We inherited Carson. He was, he was six at the time. He came on over. He, he could run a calculator. And, uh, and so, we, uh, we merged with them on February the 1st and we said we will never do another tax season merger. Kate said, you will never do another tax season merger. Well, not long after that, Kirk, sitting right back here, called and said that, um, hey, I, you, I'd like to join y'all's firm. He was a managing partner of another firm. He liked the direction of our firm. He liked where we were going. We were a good fit, and, uh, and we said, okay, Kirk, that's fine. You're in Rome. We don't have a practice in Rome. We won't have to work something out, but here's the deal. We knew Kirk, and Kirk is good people. Kirk is the type of person that Nichols Cauley and Associates want with them. So we were willing to invest in Kirk, and Kirk was willing to invest in us to make it work. And Kirk is doing a fabulous job in the Rome office now, and he joined us, I believe, in May of 2016. Uh, right after he joined us, Larry Winter, who is sitting over there, called Kirk and said, hey, Kirk, why don't you come join our firm? And Kirk said, well, I've already joined a firm. Why don't you come join our firm? And so Kirk got in touch with us. We went up and met with Larry and, uh, and we worked out a merger at that point in time. So I failed to say something that, that's important. It's a third person. My brother Farrell was the managing partner of our firm for over 30 years. He had led our firm through a lot of stuff. In 1996, I believe was the year, 95 or 96, we found out uh, that he had renal cancer and there's not a cure for renal cancer. No, it was 2006. We found out he had, he had renal cancer. But there's not a cure for renal cancer, but they said it was in one portion of his, of his kidney and they did a partial removal. And he struggled with renal cancer for several years great leader of our firm, great man. He and I had been in business together, remember, since I was nine years old, mowing grass, doing different things. Um, he died on October the 6th, 2016. So our firm is going through a tremendous amount of transition. We had, we had purchased a firm in February. We had brought Kirk in. Uh, we were talking to Larry and we were also talking to this other people that had called us and said, um, Tom Downs that had called us in somewhere in the September time frame, September, October time frame, September time frame, I guess, and said they were interested in a merger. So we had a lot of stuff going on at that point in time. Worked out the deal with uh, Larry and David right here 
and they merged in with us on November the 1st of 2016. So y'all, we've gone from 84 people to about 130, 135 people in a matter of less than a year. Hyper growth, a lot of stuff, and, and we're struggling to keep up. But I have Tom Downs out there, and his office isn't but three and a half miles from, uh, from our office. And so we, uh, we worked out a deal with Tom, and guess when we merged Tom's practice into our firm? February the 1st of 2017. So within one year, we've gone from 84 employees to about 150, 155 employees. And it was hyper growth for us. And, and it put some stress on our infrastructure. But I think we're beginning to settle out from that now. And it has been a great experience. The most important thing you can do is when you are looking for partners is to find the partners that fit your culture. So I'm going to describe our culture to y'all, and this, may, this could get me in trouble, but it is who we, it is. And if you don't like it, then you probably don't need to join us. Our culture is based on Judeo-Christian principles. You don't have to believe what I believe, but we're going to follow those principles. And one of the biggest parts of those principles is serving others and the act of forgiveness. Okay? And I think the biggest part of it is the act of forgiveness. Because I'm going to screw up. You're going to screw up. I've got to give you opportunities to screw up, but I've got to be willing to forget it. Maybe not forget it, but forgive it. And let's move on. And that is important. That is who we are. And, and, and I think that's what binds us together and makes it work. And so I think I've described Nichols Colley and Associates. I've given you all some idea of who we are. And I've talked a little bit about who I am, but the only reason I talked to you about who I am is I wanted to convey to y'all some things I believe about leadership. Some things I believe are important in the leadership arena. I hope you got some nuggets that you can take away. I hope you learned something from what I've said today.